Absent Friends by Ads Queenie Bond Chapter 1 <coughs> uh, You know I never thought I'd have to read one of these but none of us really thought we'd be here, did we? William Shakespeare once said Words are easy, like the wind Faithful friends are hard to find. Well, to be honest, it couldn't be more wrong. Words? Words are not easy. And I'm a journalist. And friends? <laughs> hell, I have, like, no friends. I mean, who the hell are you, people? I don't know half of you. And the other half of you, I do know. And I'd hardly call a friend. She was my only friend. The only person who I'd let in enough to call my friend. I loved her. A lot. And that's all i got to say. Thank you. A touching eulogy, I'm sure you'll agree. And to be honest, I meant every word. I really was a cold person back then. No one ever really got close enough to know the real me. Emily was the only person that got me, you know? I suppose a lot of people would blame my dad. He wasn't exactly the happiest of people at the best of times. He was an editor for a pretty snooty upper-class newspaper. The kind of paper that manages to feed racism, sexism and basically any other negative-ism you can think of. He never really wanted kids, I'm sure of it, but my mum was totally different by comparison. My mum was the greatest. She'd pick me up every day after school and go for dinner at a really awesome restaurant. We'd stay out all weekend, going to the park and bowling. She was my best friend, the only person I could truly count on. No one could ever replace her. Personally, I think that's where my problems stem from. When you love and depend on someone that much, when they're taken away, it hurts even more. I was 14 when she left. She didn't say a word. Just took off in the night. I couldn't believe that the one person that I could count on in my life, the one person that I trusted more than anyone else, would just disappear into the night. Without even a goodbye. I kind of lost faith in people then. Became a bit of a recluse. I studied hard and managed after much, much pushing from my father to get a degree in journalism. Naturally, I wasn't going to be pursuing the same career as my right-wing dickhead of a father. No, no, I was going to do something a lot more worthwhile than that. But instead, I got a job working for a gossip magazine as the agony aunt. And let me tell you, for someone with content for most people, it's not the easiest of jobs. But somehow I managed to pull it off. I tell you, these magazines are a complete piss take. I'm almost certain every single person that works on them thinks they're a waste of time. But I suppose every cloud has a silver lining or some form of stupid cliche. As that's how I met Emily. Wow. What a woman. I remember her first words to me. Like it was yesterday. Oh, you're one of the most horrible people I've ever met. Yeah, we didn't really get off on the right foot. It was my opportunity to give a speech at their monthly head of departments meeting and my memory's a little bit hazy but I'm pretty sure I made some snarky remark about the hot or not section of the magazine which happened to be the one she was in charge of. Anyway, I don't know what it was about Emily but there was something about her that was just entrancing. Maybe it was her no bullshit attitude and maybe it was her gorgeous ass but it drew me to do something that I didn't do a lot. Apologise. I explained how I was trying to act all big and how it was a really crap thing to say. And then I asked if I could buy her a drink to say sorry. Well, ten years later we were married. Funny how things work out, I suppose. So, like I said, the greatest thing about Emily was how well she knew me. I'd only have to twitch my eyebrow when she knew I was getting pissed off. It was kind of annoying at times, but because of the way she was, it just worked. Her death was almost like a reset button, taking me back 12 years. 
one moment she was there and I could cope with the day-to-day life of socialising with people. The next she's gone and I'm back to square one. A few days after the funeral, my father-in-law Bernard came round to see me. He was a really nice guy. He was always really welcoming and I was always civil while still maintaining my distance. Hello, Rory. Oh, hey. Can I come in? Um, sure. Bernard walked in, almost like a complete stranger to the house. This was his daughter's house, but now it felt like a foreign one to him. Beer bottles strewn everywhere, the stench of unwashed clothes in the air, crap daytime TV blaring from the 42-inch plasma. Beer? I say, walking towards the fridge. Oh, no, thank you. Suit yourself? I sit down on the couch and ask Bernard to join me on the adjacent chub chair. Look, Rory, I know that you and I haven't exactly ever got on very well. Whenever you and Emily visited, you were often quite distant, but I never pushed you. I always just kept my distance, and I honestly thought that we were starting to build a really good relationship. I placed my beer onto the coffee table in front of me and looked at Bernard. Listen, Bernard, you're not Emily, you're not my dad, and you're not really my friend. I don't want any more friends. Friends leave, and they die. I've had my fill of losses. But look at yourself, Rory, sitting alone, drinking, no one even to share it with. You need to talk about things. I don't need to talk about anything. Emily's gone. She's dead. No amount of talking or friendship is going to bring her back, Bernard. You could tell that one hurt. He just lowered his head and took a deep breath in before pushing out his words. I know, Rory. God knows I know. I'm trying to stay strong for everyone, but it's hard, Rory. No father should ever have to bury his own daughter. She wasn't buried, she was cremated. I know, Rory! I know. By this point, he's standing, towering over me, like he's about to thrash me or something. He sighs and heads towards the door. If not me, then please speak to someone, Rory. Don't just sit here and wait for death. (laughs) It'll come either way. Might as well share a beer with him. Bernard left and shut the door. Would you believe me if I said I felt bad? Sure I did, I felt awful. But that's what I do, I just push people away and hope that they disappear. Alone was good for me. As far as I was concerned, I just wanted to live out my life in the shadows. A ghost to all around me. Going to work was a struggle. I kind of had to talk to people there, especially as my job entailed to replying to people's agony on emails. You honestly would not believe the crap I have to read. Dear Angela. Yes, my agony aunt name was Angela. Ask Rory doesn't have quite the same ring to it, does it? Dear Angela. My sex life is going down the tubes. My husband and I barely have sex once a month. The reason being that he can only get aroused if I eat a bacon and tuna milk sandwich with a fez on while Simon and Gunfunkel play in the background. It was fun at first, but it's getting a bit old. Any tips? Signed, The Sound of Silence in the Bedroom. Oh god, the ones with the bad anonymous names were the worst. Of course, the really disturbing ones like that don't get put in the magazine. But the ones that do get put in were just as bad. The worst thing was that my advice was just as bad as half the time. One woman wrote in saying that she had a suspicion that her husband was having an affair behind her back. And I replied with, Dear reader, if you suggest that your husband is cheating on you, just confront him. Or, if you're worried he'll lash out because he's an aggressive person, you should really call someone more qualified, like a private investigator. If your budget is quite small, then look for his wallet, find his condoms, and use a pin to prick little holes in him. No more secret affairs. I honestly don't know how I lasted so long. 
but my time was almost up it seemed as my boss, Mr Jacobs, was on his way down to my office. This was a very rare occurrence because, like I said, I'm certain that no one really cared that much about the magazine as much as people that buy that trash anyway. Mr Jacobs was the closest representation to a human bumblebee I've ever seen. He had a relatively large tummy, but fairly skinny legs. He buzzed about the office going from desk to desk just simply saying hello to people and having a chat. He then head back into his office slightly out of breath. I don't know how he managed to remain so fat because all I ever see him eat was yogurts. Seriously, yogurts for breakfast, yogurts for lunch, peach, strawberry, I even saw a rhubarb one once. I have never seen a man eat so many of the damn things. I wouldn't be surprised if he had a calcium deficiency. He knocked lightly on my office door and entered. Morning Rory, trust you slept well? Not particularly sir, no. Excellent. Right, so here's the deal. Your last entries. Well, how can I put this nicely here? They were really bad. I mean this, for example. Uh, like a rose having its petals slowly picked away, eventually it just becomes lifeless and bleak. Yeah, some replies got fairly bleak in my morning stages. This is the Ask Angela page of one of the most prestigious magazines in the country. I'm asking you to pretend to be a middle-aged woman, giving advice to men with erectile dysfunction and to women who think their boyfriend is sleeping with his secretary. Not some Shakespearean sonnet. Please rewrite these and get them back to me by the end of the day, or you'll get a strike. He smiled, placed the replies onto my desk, and walked out, greeting everyone as he headed back to his office for another yoghurt. When I wasn't going to work or at home sitting on my arse drinking beer, I was at the pub sitting on my arse and drinking beer. This was a fairly regular occurrence for me as it gave me a chance to get a bit of fresh air. So regular that I merely had to grunt at the barman and he'd give me my usual, then I'd sit down at my usual table that people would usually avoid. Likely because of my avoidable misdemeanour, but most likely because of the stench of my Joy Division t-shirt that I'd been wearing for six consecutive days. Either way, it kept human contact to a bare minimum. One time, a woman, called Sadie, actually came over to me and attempted what I assume was a vague attempt of chatting me up. Something, as I'm sure you can imagine, I was enthralled by the prospect of. She walked over to me in a short pink miniskirt, heels that would cripple you just by looking at them, a phone with more glitter on it than a drag queen's armpit in one hand, and a glass of what I'm assuming was a vodka and coke in the other. Hiya! She says in that sort of shrill voice that just sends a shiver down your spine. Hi. You waiting for someone? Nope. Mind if I sit here? If you want. She sits down and smiles at me. And she has a pretty nice smile, to be fair. So, you all out on your own, then? She says, leaning in towards me. No, no, my friend's sitting right here. He's a ghost. Oh, I... I see. She laughs, almost as if this she's not sure if I'm kidding. So, what do you do for a living? She asks me. Clearly a very important question to ask a stranger. I work for a magazine. Oh, wow. Anything I would have read? Well, um, you do like the sort of person that would read Greetings magazine. Oh my god, I totally do. By this point, I was just totally bored. Look, I'm going to make this as painless as possible. I've just got out of a very serious relationship that ended in my wife passing away. I don't enjoy company that much, and to be honest, if I did, you don't seem like the sort of company that I'd keep. So unless you're going to offer to buy me a drink, then could you please bear me your brainless excuse for small talk and piss off? She looked quite speechless, unsurprisingly. It was a pretty harsh turn down. I think I'll pass on the drink. Okay, see you later then. She picked up her what I now know was a rum and coke and walked back to the other end of the bar. I headed back home and fumbled at my keys, desperately attempting to find the correct one. After dropping them twice, I managed to find it and fell in through the door. I managed to crawl to the couch and lay down, breathing a sigh of relief. I passed out, only to be awoken by the smashing of a glass coming from the kitchen. I awoke with a start and looked towards the kitchen door. The air began to get colder and colder. I shivered as I stared around the house as it began to fill with a light fog. I stared anxiously at the door. Who's there? I shouted. By this point, I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> 
Was it the booze? Did that girl slip me something? The door handle of the kitchen door slowly turned and the fog around the door cleared. As it opened, a bright light shone through and a ghostly choir seemed to fill the air. Something came over me. I felt something I hadn't felt in a while. Could it be? A figure gently emerged from the bright light. But like a woman. The light was so bright I could barely see. My muscles were contracting from the cold when I squeezed out the only word I could muster. Emily? With that, the figure fully emerged and made itself known. Boo! The fog cleared and the light dimmed as the room quickly turned to normal, <laughs> revealing a man with skin so white you could barely work out if it was actually skin. He was wearing a red t-shirt and grey shorts with some trainers and on his head he was wearing a blonde wig. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. He laughed as he closed the kitchen door. What, what the hell are you doing in my house? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. I was just having a bit of fun. Look, I don't know what kind of drugs you're on, but you need to get out of here right now or I'm calling the police. <coughs> well, I'm not on drugs, I can tell you that, but I did steal one of your beers. Hope that's cool. He said, wandering around the living room. No, it's not cool! Get the hell out of my house! Whoa, okay, I can understand why you'd be a bit upset, but let's just be rational here. Rational? You've broken into my house! Create a fucking light show in my kitchen, stolen my beer, and you're wearing a wig. Exactly what part of this is rational? You forget making the room go all cold and the ghostly music. Great, that's Halloween. Exorcist. That's the one, yeah, that's the one. He corrected me, slinking down into the tub chair. Wait, that was you as well? Yeah, one of the tricks I learned back in the day. In regards to me breaking in, I didn't exactly break in? By this point, as you can imagine, I'm totally confused. The experience had totally sobered me up and I really didn't know what to think. What do you mean, tricks? Well, they teach you that sort of stuff when you start out, you know. Start out as what? He turned to me and looked at me like I was a crazy one. Are you for real? Are you for real? You're wearing a wig! Oh yeah. <laughs> Silly. He laughed and took the wig off, replacing it with a peat cat which he turned backwards. Please. What the hell is going on? Are you serious? You really haven't figured it out? No I haven't! Please, fucking enlighten me! <clears throat> How do I put this gently? I'm a ghost, you dumbass! I paused. It's not every day you meet a ghost, let alone one that just comes outright and says that they are a ghost. A ghost? You mean like Casper? No, not like goddamn Casper! Would Casper the friendly ghost come and haunt you wearing a wig, attempting to resemble your dead wife? That'd be a weird episode. At this point, a billion questions just all came at once. I mean, was this guy for real? Or was he just some really clever burglar that has expert knowledge in special effects? Aren't ghosts normally, like, invisible? Sometimes we are. Depends on the ghost. A lot of ghosts reveal themselves to humans, it's surprisingly common. It's just that most people don't go and blab about it, because they'd probably be considered crazy, right? Oh, you're not wrong. For a ghost, it made a lot of sense. Like I said, I had sobered up, and to be quite honest, I needed a beer. Do you want a beer, Consider you've already helped yourself? Yeah, go on then, if you don't mind. I went to the kitchen and brought back two beers handing one to the ghost who took a big swig. How can you drink that if you're dead? I mean, shouldn't there just be a big puddle of beer on the floor? Nah, that's just an urban myth. A lot of ghosts can withhold food and drink. I mean, some ghosts can't, like spectres and ethrals. Man, they are weird. They have, like, half a body, or they're just a cloak. It's a bit creepy. Little 
turned on as well. Whatever. The point is, it's freaky shit. You, they can't eat or drink. Not successfully anyway. But common ghosts like me can. We just can't really taste it. I sit down and take a big sip. So why do you bother drinking it? For once he seemed stumped. He has a little think and then replies. Well, it seems the dumb thing to do in certain crowds. And I seem to remember enjoying it when I was alive. So how long have you been a ghost for? The ghost smiled as he placed the beer down on the table. You know what? I couldn't tell you. Time sort of goes to the back of your mind when you're dead. Time is for the living. Why count it when you got all the time in the world? Again, he made a good point. It was then I realised the situation I'd found myself in. Here I was, sat in my living room, having a full-blown conversation with someone. Not just anyone, in fact, but a ghost. The thing was that at this point, it felt pointless to even argue with myself about it. You're not exactly what I expected of a ghost. This is like something out of a film. Yeah, and where do you think those sorts of ideas come from? Ghosts! We don't all go around spooking people all day. In fact, most residents of the underworld don't come up to the world of the living at all. You need a ghost license to do that, and sometimes they are more trouble to get than they're worth. So, what's the point of getting one, then? Well, it can get pretty lonely down there, in the underworld. Ghosts aren't really much company. You get the odd one that will hang out with you for a bit, but... Well, they all go eventually. That was something I knew all too well. Somehow I had something in common with someone that's not even alive anymore. He stood up and down the rest of his beer. Right, I'm afraid my shift is over, mate. I'm assuming you'll be in tomorrow? Uh, yeah, I suppose I will. Sweet, catch you on the flip-flop, Mo Hizzy, for sure, 20 in the fall, cruising down the 69, I'm not, I'm not street, I'm not street, I'm a ghost, so I don't have a street, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Just as the ghost was about to leave, I shouted out, wait, wait, what's your name, man? He turned to me, smiled, and said, Sonny, and you're Rory, I'm Sonny, you're Sonny. No, you're Rory, I'm Sonny. That's how it is. That's the characters we play. See you later, man! Absent Friends, Chapter 1 Written by Ads Queenie Bond Starring Ads Queenie Bond as Rory Maxim Thompson as Sonny Cat Bond as Emily Saul Reed as Bernard Paul Malpass as Mr. Jacobs and Natalie Hawkins as Sadie. Opening and closing song by For the Hornets. Artwork by Lee Smith.